Hello, everybody, and welcome to Investing with IBD podcast, sponsored by Scoofus Capital Management. It's Justin Nielsen here, and it is Wednesday, May 25th, 2022. And joining me, as always, right by my side, virtually, is Arusha Pires. He is a portfolio manager at O'Neill Global Advisors. And uh, nice of you to wear the USC uh, T-shirt. He, he did that first, so I had to go out and change, uh, put on my UCLA uh UCLA garb. Um, there is a, a little bit of a rivalry here. And I, I just mentioned to him that my niece is actually going to USC for graduate school, even though I was an undergraduate uh, at, at UCLA myself. But hey, what is your connection to USC? I, I went to graduate school there too. You went to graduate school there too? Yeah. I, yeah it Sorry, doesn't surprise me. It doesn't <laughs> surprise me. I, I knew there was there was something behind that. So, uh, I mean, basically, folks, you got to understand, we've actually already been speaking for an hour, and we just started the show. It, it, uh, <laughs> luck, luckily, our editor uh, didn't hit record for all of that other stuff because uh, it, it was it was ugly. Um, but we're glad to be here now and uh, a very interesting market to talk about. Um, what we'll do is we'll do a little bit of what's going on with the current market, kind of touch on uh, how things are. But I think it's important that we take a look at previous bear markets. There's so much you can learn from history, uh, just understand how to manage your emotions, how to manage your trades, and to over get that overview of the market indexes and what they look like during bear markets and, more importantly, the recoveries. So we'll spend some time on that. And as always, we'll take a look at a few stocks that are looking interesting and setting up. So Arusha, how about we get right to it? It's a strong day in the market. Is it all guns a blazing? Oh, well, it, it was a strong day if you're looking at one day. Right? <laughs> right. But if you keep it in perspective of what's been going on this whole year, not necessarily that strong a day, especially when you look at the, the volume. So when you put the price and volume together, uh, it, it was an okay day, uh, but it didn't qualify for a falter day. We could have had a falter day today if we had volume that was higher than the previous day on the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ was up, uh, closed up more than uh, more than a percent, one, one and a half percent. And so we, if we actually had volume higher than the previous day, and that bar was not that high <laughs> to overcome, but it wasn't able to do it, but we would have been back in a confirmed uptrend just by using that simple uh, indicator of the fall today. Yeah, and now for the S&P 500, um, it looked like the NYSE volume was potentially coming in a little bit higher. I don't know if we've gotten the official volume yet. It usually comes it did, to actually. us around this time. Okay, so um, you know the NYSE volume looked like it was potentially higher, but the S&P 500 didn't quite get the percentage gain that we need. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. we, we finished up a little under a percent here and and so e even though you know ibd the market seemed they're going to keep it around one one point two five percent so they intentionally keep that bar pretty low mm -hmm. but you still need the volume higher than the day before that is a critical point but justin we probably should talk about this concept because we've gotten some questions on this over the last week when last week's falter day was called uh, the reason we keep the bar pretty low, uh, 1.25 or higher at that point, is to enable us not to miss a rally, a potential yeah, rally right. at that point, right? Mm -hmm. if, and, and you talk a little bit about kind of the, the goal that Bill set for you, for you guys years ago. Well, and, and again, this is internally, um, you know, what he would tell us is, hey, it's, it's really important that you don't miss the follow through day because... Uh, you know, being being aware of it and being ready, uh, he didn't want to be caught flat-footed. He was always saying that: don't be caught flat-footed. Um, so there, and there were a couple cases, not many. There were a couple cases um, where a follow-through day that did work and was powerful did happen on a day that was below average volume, um, but it was heavier than the day before. So that's why I said, look, it's got to be volume heavier than the day before, uh, but you know, volume. Yeah, it should be above average, but that's not necessarily an absolute requirement. And he suggested that in in his book, How to Make Money in Stocks. You know, he did refer to it should be above average. Um, and then in the fourth edition, he referred to it as, hey, it should be in most cases. So kind of hedged a little bit more. Uh, yeah. But you know, one thing I will say is that he he did like it to have a sense of power. And this is where in the late '90s. Uh, because of the increased volatility that was going on at that time. I mean, look, you know, 1% one, 1 was his threshold for 
decades, right, before the 90s. And then Mm -hmm. in the 90s, the late 90s, 2000, 1% was that was below average for a day, right? You had <laughs> you had most of the days that were trading well above that. So it just didn't make sense to keep that that threshold. Um, and he, he wanted to make sure that people understood, like, it, you really want to see some power. And that was one thing, if we just take a look at the NASDAQ composite again, I would say, hey, this, this, is, this is one thing you would have to be aware of, that the NASDAQ composite, if that were a follow-through day, it would be very unusual that we were still trading inside your rally day. You know, your rally day happened on Friday. Um, and why was that a rally day? Because it was a day that was down. So how can you call that a rally day? Uh, well, number one, first, the ra- the previous rally failed, right? We got that follow through day um, and we had our low. That low of the rally became the, low, the, the, the line in the sand. Once we undercut that, that was, okay, that rally has officially failed. Now, Basically, the day after the follow through day, we were getting very suspicious because we know that when once you undercut the low of the follow through day, then or, or close below that, I should say that um, your, your chance of, su- of success go way down. Plus, you had increased distribution. So a lot of factors in there that said, OK, this this might not work out. The undercut was the official rally is dead. But look at how far up the lows that that, that came um, a very wide spread, very big distance between the high and the low of that day. Um, and it closed in the upper half. 62% uh, was the closing range. If you look at the top of the range as being 100%, the bottom of as 0%, that was 62% range on that rally day. And we are still trading inside that. So to have a follow through day where you haven't even made progress above your rally day, you know, I, I've, I've looked at a lot of examples and there just aren't, uh, there just aren't, these powerful rallies that start that way. I usually think of it as geometry. If you're going to have two points that create a line and that line isn't an uptrend, well, right now the two points are kind of sideways. Uh, they're, they're not really showing an uptrend at this point. Yeah, it will, I, and, and the way I've always looked at it, and now I remember like 20 years ago when I was learning this, and I would see in the paper at that time when, when the outlook would change, it's a confirmed uptrend i would think at that time all right let's put all my money in we should get a rally here right we're back in a confirmed uptrend it's going to work but that's not really the intention of the fall today the the fall today gives you the first signal that the market might have a chance to work this is where a rally could potentially start now the next part and it's even more important in my opinion are there stocks setting up and breaking Mm -hmm. out that actually give you an opportunity to get exposure to the market. And so going back to last week, there there were some in the energy sector, there were some, and and I I went and tried one stock just to see and get some feedback because the rule is on a fall through day, look for something to buy. And so it's not exact. You you can look at and see how the volume is tracked and say, you know what, I think we're we're gonna get a fall through day. Let me buy something a little small, right? I went small. At that point, got the feedback, and very quickly, the next few days, I was I, I cut my losses and kind of backed away. Mm-hmm. So it's both markets and a stock setting up. And the reality is, we just don't have that many stocks set up at this point. But you yeah. have to kind of just treat them all all very seriously and keep an open mind. Mm-hmm. Now. As much as we don't have a lot of stocks setting up, we do still have these areas, as you mentioned, yes. oil and gas is still, I mean, it, it just looks so different from the market indexes. Uh, I mean, no matter what you look at, whether it's the Sector Spider Fund XLE, um, or if you're looking at some of the other ETFs like, um, you know, the the explorers and producers like XOP, um, you know, they, they, they're at they're at new highs, you know, they're Whereas the indexes are trading below their 200 day, below their 50 day, below their 21 day, heck, below their 10 day, you know, a lot of times uh, these these areas are making new highs and so look very different. Of course, the relative strength lines on these um, are are skyrocketing or in some cases looking vertical. Um, so, you know, there's that whole thing about, oh, well, there's always a bull market somewhere. You, you just have to find it. Uh, is Is that is that enticing you into some of these areas that have been working for most of this year? Maybe a little bit, but I, mm-hmm. I, I'm still playing very small and, and I'm hardly playing at all right now. Uh, the only, and, and the main reason is 
because I, I'm just not as used to trading the energy stocks. They just trade yeah. a little bit differently. So I get thrown out a little bit quicker. And, and so I'm not as great as handling them. Uh, that being said, those who are who are, who can trade this and it's, it's really not that bad. But um, but those who are making progress in the energy in energy stocks or energy ETFs keep doing that. Right. In the end, it always comes down to how are you doing in the environment? And if you're making money, if you're in sync with the market, you keep going that way. Just know that the odds are a little bit more against you just because it's not a broad market. But that being said, if you're in energy it essentially is a bull market just within that sector. Right, yeah. Um, so, but you do have to be careful because as we saw, uh, certainly over the last few weeks, um, they were coming after a lot of the different areas of strength. Um, I mean, heck, we saw with the food stocks, um, I mean, you know, that's what you usually consider as safe, but um, XLP, I mean, look at that drop. You know, yeah. uh, the consumer staples is usually where you go as your flight to safety. and sure this was having this very great relative strength line um you know trading above the 50-day moving average line and then it just like got the rug pulled out from under it uh you know i mean you know between tyson uh tyson foods i mean hershey's i mean that came down a lot you had walmart target raw stores basically if you weren't down 25 percent, then you weren't a real retail chain um you know, for that week. So it, it just was a lot of devastation going on in the retail area. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of these consumer staples uh, as the fears of what what kind of demand is the consumer going to be bringing to this, especially with the Fed, uh, you know, the only thing that they can control right now. Right. And and Fed, Fed Chairman Powell has been very clear about this. He says, look, with all the supply issues, that's not something that is under our mandate. It's not something we control. We can only control the demand side of things. And I think, uh, you know, over the last couple of weeks with earnings reports and guidance and stuff, I think that a lot of people have gotten a little concerned about what what is the consumer going to be doing in this um, you know, over the next few months. Yeah. And I think this whole year has highlighted why we do things the way we do them. Because for most of the stocks, energy excluded, right? One, It's always three out of four stocks are going to go with the market trend. Mm -hmm. One out of four are going to go against it, and that's the energy stocks. But besides that, all the other stocks started falling apart, or most of them started falling apart months ago, right? And it's just been cascading. And, and we, I can't remember the first time we moved into a correction, but either at the very beginning of the year or definitely at the end of last year, uh, when you had the end of November, a lot of the tech stocks mm -hmm. topped and really started selling off. And that was kind of the last batch of tech stocks. Before that, a lot of the stocks that are part of the ARC uh, ETFs and stuff like that, they topped in February of 2021. But uh, if you're using charts, you might not necessarily know the fundamental reason or the macro reason why things are happening the way they are but you clearly see it on the charts that they're breaking key support areas and that you're losing money right and right. they're not <laughs> acting healthy at that point and so mm -hmm. if you listen to the market and if you listened five months ago or so the market was slowly pushing you out mm -hmm. and for the most part kept telling you to stay out unless you were making progress in in a number of those uh, energy stocks or commodity stocks mm -hmm. and i think sometimes what can be difficult is especially Look, in 2020, we had the COVID crash, and that was unusual. You know, the B-shaped recovery that we saw uh, is not typically how you recover, right? You know, when you have such a big break like that, you usually have to have some time to recover. Um, whereas in this case, uh, we, we topped in, you know, the end of February, um, hit, the, hit the bottom at the end of March, and a couple weeks later, it was off to the races, you know, yeah. by by may it was like oh they're they're the market looked like there wasn't a problem anymore um now for a lot of people what they were looking at is man if i had just held my stocks if i just held on to the stocks that i had and not bothered selling them i would have been way ahead of the game uh just by waiting for a few months but that hasn't been the case this time uh there have been a lot of these stocks where sure you could have given them some room but man if you if you gave them too much room, you you quickly saw yourself down 30, 40, 50, and it just, you know, it, it's gotten worse. I mean, just look at Snap. You know, Snap reported earnings this week. They were already down 70% in 
earnings came out and they were down another 45% that day. It's, you know, this is why we don't try and pick the bottoms on these because it's too hard, uh, at least for me. I, I, I'm just not good at it. Uh, it. It can be enticing because you think, man, if I just get one of those, I mean, what, what, what was that big blue week uh, that Snap had? How, how much was it up on that week? Um, uh, up 27%, 28%. Yeah. You know, people look at, oh, if, I'm, if I can just catch the bottom right and be up 28% in a week, how great is that? But you forget about all of these other uh, devastating losses that are kind of along the way. And that's where, you know, when the trend is down, you just got to realize, uh, you know, the trend is your friend. And when it's down, uh, that's just telling you something very clear. Yeah, I, I'm, for years, I was always kind of feeling like I was the, the, the grumpy old man. <laughs> right where these markets would recover so fast after showing a lot of distribution, and I, you know, I, I always play defense and I would cut my losses and I get moved to the sidelines, and then they kind of rebound. And I think 2020 was a perfect example where it all of a sudden came back, and a month later everything was kind of back to normal. And I'd be like, you know, warning people, yo, you wait, you wait, you know, you, you gotta <laughs> wait, you gotta wait again. Uh, uh -huh. But. It, that that's the thing. It, it's like finally the markets are going to get you. The those got away in 2020 or even 2018 or a number of the other uh, quick corrections that we had over the last 10 years. They got away with it. They got away with buying the dips. They got away with being undisciplined, sure. and they learned bad habits. And you can get away with it nine out of ten times, but it's that tenth time that's going to get you. And it looks like this might be that 10th time right now. And so we'll have to wait and see, but all the rules, especially all those aggressive sell rules that we have where people always question, why are you cutting at 8%? Why, mm -hmm. why are you, you so quick to move the sidelines? We do everything we can to avoid the portfolio destroying event. We can yeah. always recover from getting shaken out at 2020 when we got out and in late February and got back, you know, in eight, early April, that's okay. You know, we're, we're willing to kind of give, give some of that up from the, the, the rally off the bottom to protect ourselves, but we're going to do everything we can 10 out of 10 times to avoid what's going on right now, because mm -hmm. corrections are the things, especially bear markets. That's the great equalizer right there. Everything's going to kind of come back. And, and that's where you have to kind of answer to the, the stock market gods for all your bad habits and, and what you've gotten away with. Mm -hmm. And make no mistake, this is not anyone passing judgment, because certainly no. when I started, it was in the late 90s. And if you want to talk about undisciplined and bad habits, uh, you know, the late 90s was the, the poster child for being allowed, you know, allowing you to think that you're a genius, uh, that the stock market is easy. All you have to do is, you know, buy a stock and it goes up because it's, it's just that easy. I certainly had that feeling when I started. Um, but again, I, I quickly learned my lesson in 2000 to 2003 uh, and during that bear market where the NASDAQ was down 79% that, oh, yeah, you know what? You have to have some risk management rules uh, or you're, you're going to get decimated. So when we no, come exactly, back, Justin, oh, very, very, very quickly, it's just, yeah, mm -hmm. I learned all those bad habits in 99 like you. Mm -hmm. I wrote everything down in 2000, mm -hmm. 2001. That's where the markets kind of and, and that's at the point, right, where for for. Yeah. And so definitely not passing judgment on anybody. This is almost kind of the 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 rite of passage. Right. Right. Where <laughs> we've all been get, there. <laughs> yeah. You get caught in one of these bear markets. You lose all that you gain the year or two before. Mm -hmm. And you probably lose a little bit more, too. And hopefully mm -hmm. you still have something left. But that's almost a moment of truth where you have to kind of look in the mirror and say, am I OK with the strategy or not? Now, there are plenty of people who are OK with the kind of buy and hold and mm -hmm. ride through all the cycles. And that's fine as long as you have the proper risk management, maybe you have a lot of smaller positions and things like that. But if you're going to concentrate more, if you're going to really go for some of these high flying stocks that our system's going to identify at the right mm -hmm. times, uh, you got to use those sell rules. And if you get caught in one of these bear markets, you kind of have to take a step back and say, am I okay with writing all these down? If not, then go back to the book, go back to the lessons, learn them because now you have some real solid experience to learn from yeah. your mistakes and then if you truly learn from those you're you're never going to get caught in one of these again and that's the key i'm never after this one i've never gotten and like you justin right we've never really gotten caught again we've gotten hit 
sure, we right. give some oh, back. Sure. Mm-hmm. But we've never re- just gotten decimated by another bear market like the, the 2000 and 2002. And I guess one of the important things to just kind of wrap wrap a bow on this is uh, one of the things I did, at least, was I had to read the book a yes. couple more times. Right. And it became a different book to me because now I had lived through some of the things he had talked about. And I'm like, oh, now I get now I get why you said that. Um, or I looked at my own portfolio and I mean, I I got a you know, I took a 50 percent plus haircut. And, uh, you know, luckily. I was small and I didn't have much money at that time because otherwise I would have been devastated uh, if I had like piled in a bunch of like an inheritance of a huge amount of money. I had a two thousand dollar inheritance that I was working with. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's it's better to learn those lessons early. Uh, and again, post analysis, that's going to that's going to make it so you do learn the lesson as long as you. Uh, really take the lessons to heart. So when we come back, we're going to take a look at some of these bear markets of the past because there's so much that can be learned from past markets. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Peter Skoufis, founder of Skoufis Capital, has successfully managed money using Bill O'Neill's strategy for the last 17 years. Peter's missed major market crashes, such as the financial crisis of 2008 and most recently the coronavirus crash of 2020. One of his strengths is finding new leadership in new market uptrends. If you would like to talk to Peter and get his thoughts on the current market and what to do now, or get a complimentary review of your portfolio, feel free to contact him at scoofuscapital.com. That's S-K-O-U-F-I-S capital, C-A-P-I-T-A-L.com. And fill out the contact form or by calling 866 562 2634. Protect your capital and don't miss the next market uptrend. Okay, everyone, welcome back to Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Scoofus Capital Management. It's Justin Nielsen here along with O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager Arusha Pires, who joins me every week. And uh, Arusha, we were talking about some of our experiences. I mean, uh, certainly when I started in the late 90s, uh, you know, I, I, I certainly witnessed one of the worst bear markets ever. Uh, with a 79% drop in the NASDAQ. Uh, I was told it was a once in a lifetime event. And then just lo and behold, a few few years later, uh, we had the great financial crisis where the <laughs> indexes were down 57%. And I was told, oh, this is a once in a lifetime event too. And uh, you know, don't even get me started on COVID being a once in a lifetime event because I've had a lot of lifetimes. I feel like I'm a cat at this point. Um, but let's take a look at the NASDAQ composite um, Certainly, one of the things that was kind of interesting about the 08 great financial crisis is leading up to it in 07, um, you know, it, it, it really didn't have kind of this uh, huge outsized move to the upside, but you did have a lot of stocks that were going just bananas at that time. Um, do you remember some of the ones that you were trading in, in late 2007? Yeah, I, I clearly remember it because I was actually at USC at that time oh um, really <laughs> oh really yeah, well, why yes justin <laughs> I, okay. I, I was there you know fighting on as always uh-huh. and um i I'll, I'll tell you the stocks i was in i, I was in baidu let, let me see uh-huh. if i can uh get, find the the actual date here but uh so i so as in baidu at this point and uh-huh. I sold into this is like kind of the first time I was like selling this strength because they were moving so fast. And yeah. so it was Baidu, Apple, and Google. Those are the okay. three stocks I had. Right. Mm-hmm. So I had these three stocks and I had most of my money in these three stocks. And I think I and I bought them, I think even extended a, a little bit and stuff like that. But uh, they were working, it was like every day they were they're up. They're up big and they're just working, working. And honestly, I think the only reason I was able to kind of ride through a bunch of this uh, move was because I was in class. And so I was, <laughs> I couldn't sell it. I wasn't watching the, the markets that much at that time. But during breaks, I'd go to the computer uh, lab, go go pull up my account and go, oh my God, they're, they're up even more. Uh, mm-hmm. And so by the time it was like in uh, October, I think mid-October, that's when I was like, I got to get out of some of these. This is just dumb. It was just working too well. And mm-hmm. so I ended up selling them in mid-October or early October even. And of course, they went up without me. But a few weeks later, that's when they cracked. And that's when they were they were done at that point. But that was kind of my first. So after that first lesson of 
you know, getting mauled by the bear market in 2000 to 2002, this was the time where I kind of still had that in the back of my mind, sold into strength, watched them really crack pretty hard. And then, of course, we went into market correction and I stayed out pretty much mo- all of 2008 for the, except I think maybe in March of yeah, March 2008 was a, was a brief mm-hmm. rally. But for the most part, yeah, I was I was in school. I was busy doing that. And I I just couldn't believe every time I walked by a TV, especially this was months later. So this was like a year later. Right. Or maybe like 10 months after. That's when everything really got bad. Right. And the TV is yeah. showing it. And I just couldn't remember. I just couldn't believe how much the mm-hmm. markets are moving up and down. But I was like, I just followed the rules. You know, I had no yeah. idea what was going on once again no idea about the fundamental macro kind of stuff at that time that all mm-hmm. this stuff was going to explode and blow up and all these uh financial firms are going to go out of business i just followed the charts saw the distribution got out of the market and stayed out of the market yeah yeah um i remember during this time i had um spwr sun power that was mm-hmm. uh one of the ones that i same thing wow. I, I sold that into strength um you know what? You, I mean, you, you can see you see how it's going up and up and it, it crosses 100. And then there was that first first day down. Yes. I think I, I think I got shaken out in there. You know, it's or, a good still. Yeah. Uh, you know, something like that. Or it might have been around 120, uh, m- maybe when it was two days down. And I was like, OK, this is it. This is, you know, this is too climactic. It's too much. But, you know, even if it was at the higher price of 120, I, I watched that thing go up to over 160. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, man, what kind of idiot am I? But then <laughs> there we are four days later and it's it's below it's below where I sold it. Um, you know, it, it, it's just one of those reminders of how fast they can come down. But now if we go ahead and fast forward um, and as you mentioned, yes, there was a follow through day in March of 08 where it looked like, OK, maybe it's over. Uh, you know, CLR was working a few things. But, you know, let's go ahead and take a look at. Um, just the Nasdaq composite, um, you know, you know, by by 08, this is where things just kept on getting worse and worse. Um, so, you know, if you if you thought like, um, you know, just just go to November of 08. Uh, but I mean, yeah, l- l- well, this is fine. Look at that. This looked like a bottom, right? It looked like, OK, finally, the worst is over. And um, this has already been devastating enough. It's, you know, we've been, you know, trading below the 50 day moving average line. We've been trading below the 200 day moving average line. We finally got a rally. It looked like, I mean, we, this was a strong rally from like 1400 to 1600 in just a matter of weeks. But even that didn't last. You go out a few more weeks. I mean, let's just go out a month or two. Um, and, you know, here we are. We're starting to fail by February and, and March. We were undercutting to new lows. Now, one of the things that was interesting is during this time, there were some stocks out here that were not going to new lows. Um, some of the ones that were the the strongest names out there of the of the 2009 in terms of growth, you had Apple. Uh, if you just pull that up, look at that, not making new lows. Uh, Priceline, uh, it's, it's booking now, BKNG, but at the time it was Priceline. This was still below the 200-day moving average line, the 40-week moving average line, but the relative strength line was at new highs. And when that market was going down and undercutting, this was holding up. Um, so this was one of the few times that I ever saw Bill O'Neill buying things under the 200-day line, buying things that were still off their highs by 30%. But he was looking at this and saying, look, you know, this is, this is something that's showing strength because it's not undercutting when the indexes are. The relative strength line is, is very good and it's forming some type of pattern you know he was looking for that reason that justification to get in uh, to some of these strongest names um baidu which again you know 2007 you probably thought maybe this is done but baidu was one of the strongest ones uh as well this was having a you know huge move um off its bottom but there again when the market undercut uh this one held up it came down but it held up above the previous low um, and that was that was a signal of strength uh, that that Bill was keying in on on a lot of these stocks. Yeah, so the divergences mm-hmm. are incredibly important, and and so that's definitely what you want to look for in a bear market. And but I think the e- even the easier one is using the relative strength line. Yeah, it, it, it's it's sometimes it's, it's easy to forget about the divergences when the market makes a new low, and now which stocks haven't or, or haven't made the new low. Um, but if you use that relative strength line and you're going through a bunch of stocks or using using on MarketSmith uh, the blue dot list 
or just the RS line stocks have an RS line hitting a new high, you're going to just continually be looking at the stocks that are resisting the downtrend the best. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let's go ahead and uh, go back a little bit further in time. Uh, let's go ahead and go to, um, we can do the NASDAQ at like, uh, let's say, let's say September, um, September 01, uh, September 2001, just to kind of show um, what what happened here. And and again, the, the market topped in March, but there was just like in just like in 2008, where the, there was that rally in March of 08. And things seem like, oh, maybe maybe this is OK. Maybe this is going to come out of it. Um, there was a rally in May of 2000. And I remember playing that, um, you know, until September, maybe. Um, there was a big fiber optics move. Uh, GLW, Corning, uh, was was one of the stocks I had during that time. Um, it was, you know, it, it seemed like it was coming back and, and you know, going, going to new highs. Um, you know, JDSU was also doing very well. I think Sun Microsystems. Uh, was still working. Keithley oh, Instruments, yeah. uh, SDLI. You know, you had a, you had a lot of stocks that were uh, going during that time. Uh, not all of them are ones that we can pull exactly. up anymore because some of them don't exist, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, but you know, if you go back to what the Nasdaq was doing, um, you had just after after September, there was just like this punishing punishing uh, move down. And then, of course, uh, you know, shortly after this, you had the September 11th tragedy uh, in 2001. And even then, if you just go maybe to like December of, of 01 um, or maybe um, the beginning of 02, uh, after, after that tragedy, you had this very strong move. Now, remember, the market was closed for four days. Um, you know, we had Kenny Polcari on. On the yeah. on the anniversary of September 11th, you know, talking about the experience being on that New York Stock Exchange and just um, you know the gut wrenching that was happening, but the market recovered and this was a this was a strong move. This went from 1,400 to 2,000 in a matter of weeks, and you had some of the housing stocks. NBR was uh, a, a stock that was moving um, very strongly out of this double oh, like bottom. The energy stocks, right? Yeah, yeah. Some of the energy stocks you had. Uh, um, some of the defense stocks um, were, were doing well. Um, uh, that that might have been a little bit later in 2002, but uh, maybe education. Um, you know, uh, I don't know if these these symbols still exist, but I mean, U University oh, of Phoenix. I know you don't have that UOPX. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, th that got absorbed back by Apollo. But you know, th there were things that were kind of working um, and and stuff enticing you in. But going forward, you know, the market eventually. Um, you know, bottomed out in October of 02. And, you know, by that time, that that's when, you know, you would hit kind of rock bottom, right? That's when you hit the 79%. But look at how many of those cases where it looked like, again, if you just change the date on any of those moves down, you would have sworn this has got to be the bottom. Right. There's no way we can go lower, but we did. Um, and it was not until October 02 that you finally had the the last, you know, the last gasp down but even then i don't feel like there was a lot of big gains in a lot of stocks it wasn't until fast forward to march of 03 where you had this strong move up from the october 02 bottom then you had this retracement um, and this is where we had kind of a three waves down uh very briefly all of this happening underneath the 40-week moving average line um and then in you know, March 17th of 03, that's where you had the follow through day, you had Yahoo coming out, um, you know, and just just a whole host of stocks that Amazon. were moving at that time. Yeah, Amazon, um, you know, it, it was it was Netflix. a tech bonanza, right? Yep. Um, so, but it, it's, it's important to remember that, again, even after the bottom, while you did have that strong move up, then you had this final kind of uh, drift down um, while the the bases kind of really formed. Um, I mean, sure, you had eBay. eBay, I think, was one that um, did, you know, that Bill bought off that October 2002 low and, you know, continued to work. That one didn't really give up much ground even when the market was coming in. So there again, that's that market giving you some feedback. Hey, you've got something special here. Um, and that's why he held on to it and was adding to it when the market did have its March 03 follow through day. 
But what was your recollection of this this time? Because again, this was this was early, early in both of our careers. This was kind of like the first, like, oh man, this you can you can lose your shirt in this if you're not careful. Yeah, and, and so this was this this was the environment that I was trying to learn um, mm -hmm. how how to buy stocks, and and so most of this time I just learned how to quickly sell. <laughs> um, but you got you but got that I, training right yeah and and you know and and, the, and i honestly you know looking back i don't even know why i stayed <laughs> with stocks or the system because it, it was like two and a half years of just not making money right mm -hmm. just selling and cutting losses selling 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 um but i remember in march of 2003 and so march 17 2003 too so i remember every day as it was it was march of of 2003 reading the big picture and stocks are setting up we're waiting for this fall day and then all of a sudden march 17th 2003 we had this fall day and that was on the same day we actually went into iraq you know this is what one of those yeah. questions i would throw out in the trading summits when i did that mm -hmm. and i would I'd ask everyone it's like we had this fall day on march 17th what else happened on this day and there were really two correct answers one was we that was the day we went into Iraq, which was a great example of how the markets do the opposite of your emotions, right? The mm -hmm. you know going into war, terrible news, all this stuff, and here's the market giving us signal for the next great bull market. Um, now the second answer was it was St. Patrick's Day, and so usually <laughs> we have a fall through day on St. Patrick's Day too. But um, but that was like the first time that I saw a real bull market. And I just remember thinking. It's working like the book says how it's yeah, supposed to finally. work, right? Finally. Yeah, and I and and the, the big picture did such a great job at identifying the stocks, and we pulled them up Amazon and Netflix. That that was the number one industry group at that point, and so the number one industry group uh, was there with those internet content stocks. Yeah, they broke out on the fall through day, and they were working right. So so mm -hmm. that's what I remember. Now the other thing, going back to two thousand and two, I remember trying the the October two thousand and two where it was like a six week rally there. And then mm -hmm. you kind of backed away. But kind of one of the going back to 2001, those other rallies that you were identifying, you have to take them once again at face value. You have to try something if there's mm -hmm. something breaking out. And because that could have worked right that mm -hmm. in the end, you never know until after the fact, but you have to have that feedback. But when the rally is going to truly work, what you'll find is every few days, you're going to have another opportunity to buy another stock breaking out. And so over a month or so, the market's going to slowly pull you in. You might not even make a lot of progress at that point. But then all of a sudden, the market will start taking off. And now you're already in these number of these positions. And now you're starting to gain some ground and start to see some progress. So that it, it works slowly at times. Uh, even the, in the March 2003 falter date, it took like a month before mm -hmm. it really got going. Um, but it just kept slowly pulling you in. And I think the most important thing, it didn't really push you out really quickly, right? You weren't forced out fast. Stocks weren't blown up at that point simply because everyone got worn out and everyone essentially gave up by that time because two and a half years was a long yeah. time to go through this frustration and getting knocked out of stocks over and over again. And you have to remember that, I mean, we're showing that the NASDAQ was devastated, 79% yeah. down. But remember, some of the leaders... Um, were, well, I mean, like Cisco at the time, I mean, that, that went down below $10, you know, it was, it was trading at 80 and it, it went below $10. Um, it was, it was, and it was Cisco. It's not like the internet was dead. It's not like networking was dead. Um, and Cisco still hasn't recovered. Now there's a whole host of other names that you, again, you can't even pull up the symbols anymore because they, they don't exist. They were sold for parts. Um, so it, it just kind of goes to show you that you can't be resting on your laurels and saying, hey, I'm just going to um, I'm just going to look at this and um, ignore the signals when my stock is getting getting really massacred. Um, I will say, again, I, I've, I've mentioned this before, not to pat myself on the back, but I got out really great in 2000. Um, I remember some of the stocks that I was selling like I, I was in I was in Corning myself and. I think I was, you know, selling that at, you know, near near the highs there, and um, you know, same thing with JDSU. A lot of these I remember selling JDSU and and Corning above a hundred and watching them go down to a dollar, yeah. and you know, again, oh great for me, but what I messed up on 
was every single one of those follow through days, I went in so heavy and I was good at cutting my losses. But guess what? When you go 100 percent in or even worse, I went on margin on a lot of those times. I was just buying ev anything that looked good. So I was taking all of these 8 percent losses because um, not only that, I would let something go up and it was finally like, oh, I'm making money again. And then I just couldn't believe it when it started going the other way. And so by the end of that, again, after getting out so good in 2000, my account was down 50% uh, by, by, by the time 2002, 2003 rolled around. Um, and again, luckily it wasn't that much money at the time, but uh, it was it was devastating to remember my hubris and pride at getting out so good and then to see my portfolio and look at how devastated it got. Yeah, the the market's always teaching you lessons. And at the very beginning, it's going to teach you some very, very big lessons. Yeah. And so first, it's very important, I think, to when when you're learning this, play small, play really small, mm -hmm. take a very small portion of your money. I didn't have a choice. A I didn't have much money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or that, right? But still, it wasn't devastating money. You yeah. could recover yeah. from that. Mm -hmm. But play small, learn this because the stocks, that, especially the stocks we get into, they'll move up fast, but they come down a lot faster. And so you have to have those sell rules down. You can't ride these stocks on. You have to prove, your, prove it to yourself that you can handle this, especially when the markets go against you. Now, what I think is, now, I, as I mentioned before, I think it's almost a rite of passage that you have to go through a bear market and yeah. get walloped. And mm -hmm. now here's your opportunity to truly look back, learn those lessons. But after that, now you have to learn the lessons of how to manage stocks in an uptrend, in a bull market, how to slowly scale in. So there's so many different nuances that you have to go through. So you really have to go through a number of cycles, or at least I had to go through a number of cycles before I started to understand or try to get, start wrapping my head around kind of the concepts, right? So, and then after that, now you start refining, you're refining, and you get slowly better and better over time, but it never gets easy though, too. It's always slightly different, but you ha at least have those rules that, that are gonna keep you from getting into too much trouble, uh, especially to the downside. Yeah, and as you said, it's, it's sometimes a little bit different as uh, Samuel Clemens, AKA Mark Twain said, you know, History doesn't always repeat itself, but it rhymes. Um, let's take a look. I mean, these are the two that you and I survive, you know, so I, I think we have a lot to say about these. But let's take a look at 1929. If you just go to um, go to like January 8th, 1932, uh, and we're going to look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average just to kind of, again, you know, very quickly make the point that, um, you know, in this devastating crash uh, that we had after 1929, and, you know, by 1932, this is where the Dow Jones Industrial Average, even worse than the NASDAQ being down 79 percent, Dow Jones Industrial Average was down 89 percent at the bottom. And look at this rally that, oh. you know, you had off, off that off that bottom. I mean, so strong, but very, very similar to 2003 and the October 02 bottom. You had this retracement, right? You, you, you came out of that. Um, let's go ahead and go forward to May 22nd, uh, 1936 just to kind of see how this played out. Um, and and one thing, yeah, once again, in real time, you, you would have had a fall through day at that point. Oh yeah. You go and try it, go in a little bit of money, and if it keeps working, then you buy another stock and you still keep buying as the market keeps telling you that you're right and that you're in sync with the market. And then that's how, you, and then there are gonna be some, and we're probably gonna get one of these really powerful rallies uh, in the near future or sometime in the future, a counter trend rally, or maybe it's the real a real beginning of the next bull market. But we're going to get a, a powerful move after selling off for so long. And you might, we'll probably, we'll get the fall today. You try something and then one of these kind of rallies, all of a sudden, it'll just keep pulling you in and you're not getting stopped out. And so kind of that powerful rally from the 1930s too, you would have been in it. Hopefully not too much, but you would have been in it making some progress. But then very quickly mm -hmm. uh, after that September, uh, you're, you're quickly cutting losses because suddenly you notice that these stocks aren't holding up as well anymore. Right. And even after 1933, look, you have that March, um, you, you have that strong move in the in the March quarter to June quarter. And then you have almost two years of sideways action. <laughs> And then you're finally, you know, moving again. So again, you just sometimes have to be patient. Uh, not to say that there aren't tradable rallies in here, but right. 
um, again, just just know that uh, there there are ways that these play out. So be aware of how it could play out. You could get one of these strong rallies, a retracement. Then um, you know you might have to have some time for some of these bases to finish uh, finish forming. Uh, one more thing for us to look at, and again, this will just be real quick. Um, but 1973. Let's let's go ahead and go out to like maybe 1976 or 1977. Uh, and look at the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones Industrial Average, um, either one of those. Um, here's another one where, again, in 73, you just saw this devastating, you know, pummeling that happened. You know, just, you know, every time you thought it was a low, it proved to you that it could go lower. And very similar, you had that bottom in 74, strong move up, retracement, and then that's where you were able to move um, move higher. So we could be looking at something like that. Um, you know, that, 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 that's a very typical pattern after, after some of these devastating bears. Uh, so just be aware. Again, you're going to have those, those times that try and sucker you in. You know, you're going to have those follow through days that don't work. Being very small, letting the market pull you in, using the market feedback to say, hey, you know, are my stocks working? Are my decisions working? Uh, that goes a long way in terms of allowing you to make progress. And certainly what I did in 2002 and 2003, I mean, that whole couple of years was I was so desperate to make money again. It was like, that was so much fun before. I just, I want the good times again. And I was so desperate to have them. I, I couldn't recognize when, when they weren't, you know, when they, when they were going away and, uh, and stuff. So just make sure that you're keeping your emotions in check. Yeah, and I think the other big thing when I look at this nine, 1974 example right here, keep an open mind. No matter, you know, it looked terrible here, even in the 75, but keep an open mind that, you know, you still could get a pretty decent rally after that follow through day. And, and you just got to listen to the markets. I think that's the biggest thing. I've, 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 there have been plenty of times where the markets get so bad that I get too negative and then I'm just like, there's no way this is going to work. Right. Uh, and and then I'm caught flat footed. Right. So you need to keep an open mind. You need to be flexible because these markets are going to turn when the things look the worst. And so now's the time to kind of do this exercise that we're going through right now. Look at these previous markets, really kind of get it in your head of how these markets behave where the follow through days and how they can act after the follow through days, maybe try to identify some of the stocks that were breaking out at that point, because the more you can kind of prepare mentally right now, the better prepared you'll be for the, the next great bull market. Mm -hmm. So there's some homework. Uh, pull out your how to make money in stocks. Uh, fourth edition is the one I prefer. Uh, you could either get the orange book or the green book, either one of those. And what you can do is there is the section on the market direction. Uh, take a look at that. Uh, put these into MarketSmith, change the date, look at what they look like at the time of the bottom, just so you kind of get that ingrained in your head. Go to the first chapter, look at some of the stocks. Some of these you're not going to be able to pull up, you know, because they just don't exist anymore. But look at the patterns that were happening. Uh, identify where the follow through day was, kind of mark it on your chart, you know, take a look at that, set your ruler up. Um, but yeah, you've got some homework to do, but in the long run, Hopefully it makes you more profitable. Um, when we come back, we're going to take a look at a few stocks and we're going to wrap up this segment. Peter Skoufis, founder of Skoufis Capital, has successfully managed money using Bill O'Neill's strategy for the last 17 years. Peter's missed major market crashes, such as the financial crisis of 2008 and most recently the coronavirus crash of 2020. One of his strengths is finding new leadership in new market uptrends. If you would like to talk to Peter and get his thoughts on the current market and what to do now, or get a complimentary review of your portfolio, feel free to contact him at scoofuscapital.com. That's S-K-O-U-F-I-S capital, C-A-P-I-T-A-L dot com. And fill out the contact form or by calling 866-562-2634. Protect your capital and don't miss the next market uptrend. Okay, everyone, welcome back to Investing with IBD, sponsored by Scoofus Capital Management. It's Justin Nielsen here, all along with Arusha Pires from O'Neill Global Advisors. So, uh, Arusha, I know we we kind of went a little long. Our editors, you know, giving us. I don't know what you're talking about, Justin. Uh, right, exactly. I went a little long. You were perfect. Um, so, <laughs> let's no, take I, a look. I, I, oh, I do want to say if you're still listening to this episode, right. well done. Yes. Well done. And, and the secret code. <laughs> for the you, what you use for the decoder ring. Is the decoder ring, soon. right? Yes. 
is Ovaltine <laughs> or something. <laughs> Okay, so let's take a look at some stocks, and uh, no big surprise. Uh, what, what what screen did you uh, pull some of these from? Yeah, so I just went to the open stock ideas button on MarketSmith, and I went to the the near pivot list, and we just cycled through. Hey, what stocks are coming through this? And not surprisingly, oil and gas and uh, staples utilities. Those, those yeah. are the type of stocks that are coming through. Heavily represented. Now, one one warning I do have for people if you're using the near pivot screen or some of these tight area screens, um, be aware you're going to see some, sometimes you'll see these very tight, tight patterns. And you're just like, oh my gosh, this is like not moving at all. This looks like so tight and so great. Uh, just be aware sometimes there will be uh, buyouts in a lot of those cases where you'll see, if you look, you'll see, oh, there's a cash offer. Um, you'll see a little CO uh, that will designate that there, there was a cash offer uh, on that, and that's why the tight action is happening. So you want to find things that are kind of near a pivot, um, maybe acting tight, but not not buyouts. We don't generally go for those. But uh, here we have Western Midstream. Um, you know, this is one that we've been talking about on on IBD Live for a while. Uh, I, I know I brought this up a couple times. So my one question to you, Arusha, is okay for something like this with energy stocks having moved so much this one seems like it hasn't moved that much i mean when you compare it to something like a a Devon, uh energy dvn or oxy um occidental petroleum oxy you know these are up so much more and you go back to wes and it's like yeah this this, this one just this hasn't moved does that does that bother you at all or is it like oh well maybe it's transport pipeline it's turn in the sun yeah um it generally would bother me, but I feel like with energy stocks and oil stocks, there are there have been a number of times, at least that I've seen, where I kind of assume that the stock that I'm looking at because it hasn't moved yet is a laggard, and it, and it ends up going on a pretty good run. So I, I feel like you kind of have to take it at face value here, and if it breaks out or uh, starts moving up a little bit or even pulls back to the 50 you can you can consider it and and see what happens at that point. Maybe don't expect it's going to move like some of those other stocks you mentioned. But uh, a lot of these energy stocks, it, it just seems like it's just such a big surge within the sector that it's carrying everything up. And so this has a chance. I mean, on a relative strength basis, it's at 52 week highs. The base itself that it's forming, it's been going through and kind of uh, going sideways and shaking out a lot of people for a long time. It breaks out powerfully past that 27 uh, area, the 2730 uh, area right there. That could be a significant break, and I might have a chance. A lot of it just depends on the how the market's doing. Mm -hmm. And what's note noteworthy here is, okay, we have that February 24th. Um, you know, that's that's where the market had its first kind of reversal. Well, there was one in January 24th too, um, but then you had kind of the um, the the May the March undercut. And you had that here on West Midstream as well. But what's interesting is this latest undercut, this is a stock that hasn't done it. So that's something that I think uh, bodes well for it. It's incredible that we're seeing some of these oil and gas companies with composite ratings of 98. This has a 98 composite wow. rating. Like, <laughs> when have you seen uh, that on an oil and gas stock uh, 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 until recently? Um, you know, certainly the earnings, you know, you can get a lot of choppiness in there when you're looking at the numbers. Um, you know, some some negative negative numbers there. But overall, you know, with cyclical stocks, you kind of have to forgive some of that. Um, but, yeah, this has got a lot of things going for it. Yeah, it uh, the the annual earnings are, are pretty solid. They've just been consistently moving up, and I feel like a number of these partnership type of oil stocks have been popping up on the radar over the last few weeks. So the market's uh, telling you something, and and it's uh, telling you that this is one of the areas that's uh, slowly uh, working and and might have a chance to work even more. Okay, well let's take a look at Southern Company. So this was another one that came from this screen, and you know looking at the technical action here. Uh, I mean, a, a pretty strong move that it had in March. Uh, nice flat base. This is something that just kind of uh, hasn't given up much ground. Getting supported. It's 50-day moving average line. The the base depth is only 7%. So, uh, of course, the relative strength line is just jamming up there. And, um, and this is in, uh, I mean, look, the industry group is 21 out of 197. And it's one of those powerhouses. Utility. Electric power. Literally. <laughs> right? So... 
does does the fact that it's a utility just automatically make you hold your nose and say, ah, forget it? Uh, or is is that what we've come to, that we're going to start buying utilities? Well, me personally, yeah, I guess it, it is making me hold my nose. I'm like, ah, I'll just pass on it because uh, I'm not necessarily in a rush to, to get into a utility stock. But if you have to be invested, if you have to, you know, if, if you have to be invested most of the time and you're looking for places to park money and to try to ride out uh, this bear market, it's not a bad option to have right now. Uh, it yeah. actually kind of got above the midpoint of that flat base right here uh, yesterday. And so that could be an opportunity to slowly build into a position right here because that that's uh that's past some uh, good trade, uh, a pretty decent trading range right there. So that's almost your first opportunity to build into this. And then you could add as it starts to move uh, closer to those uh, highs. But it's acting pretty well on a technical basis. If you just put this up and then tell me it was utility stock, <laughs> right. I'd be like, wow, this, this is amazing, you know? Yeah. So, Especially uh, relative to the market. Uh, yeah. I mean, that relative strength line is just straight up. It's getting the blue dot right here. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot to, to like about it from a technical basis, but then yeah, you, you, you uh, start looking at that industry group and you're like, oh, dear God, it's a, it's a utility. Uh -huh. And, you know, and looking at the long term, it just doesn't have that uh, outperformance versus the S&P 500 long term. But I look at some of these and say, OK, maybe a swing trade or something uh, that I'm just going to hold on to for a little bit. Uh, I mean, that was a 10 percent move it just had uh, not that long ago. So but it was quick. Right. It was quick. And then it kind of went yeah. right back into a base. So, yeah, uh, I mean, if you I have to trade. Mm -hmm. th this is one that, uh, you know, has provided a pretty good opportunity and to make uh, a pretty fast move as it was emerging out of the previous space. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, again, these these moves don't last. And I certainly if the market does turn, um, I wouldn't think that utilities are what's going to drive the market higher. Um, so let's go ahead and end this up with a stock that we found on the open stock ideas in terms of breaking out today. Um, and that was WWE, World Wrestling Entertainment. Were you a big wrestling fan when you were younger? Or, or are you still? Do you like uh, no, you know, I, I, wear John I, Cena clothes? And, <laughs> uh, no. you know, I was, when I was, when I was pretty young, I was a wrestling fan for a little bit. Uh, uh, Hacksaw Jim Duggan was my favorite Okay. wrestler at that point that was before they hit the you know before they really took off okay. uh, but it, they were they were starting it, it was quite popular at that point so so that those are the times but it's pretty amazing you had an how, early entry i had an early entry into the wwe yeah. yes <laughs> right, yeah. yes uh, <laughs> but it wasn't that early that, that was probably a good 15 years until where they were they're already popular but yeah. uh this this is a stock that that's gone on some really nice runs before they over the last 20, 30 years, they've turned it into a, a tremendous powerhouse type of entertainment business, right? Mm -hmm. And it's remarkable what, how, how they have really turned this into one of the top almost must watch uh, things out there if you're looking for entertainment. And, and it's setting up. It broke out of a cup with handle right here. You're getting the blue dot. And I've been trying to figure out, okay, what's new with the company right now? I know they're kind of signing their new leases on on the tv agreements and stuff like that something's something's going on here it, it's it's acting very very well and and so this is one that that i'm actually keeping an eye on yeah i, I think there's definitely been a an international push uh they've got some streaming deals uh licensing agreements going on international i know middle east is a recent uh, area that they've they've moved into um i can't remember if it was like india as well um but yeah that's definitely part of it part of it is just i mean it's going to have some pretty easy comparisons now that they're having live events again versus a year ago when you know when they weren't uh you know so just just bringing the live events back but certainly a lot of um a lot of streaming deals um heck uh my my son, he's he's got some some of the characters. Uh, you know, we have a little ring uh, nice. too that <laughs> that you can uh, fight, and uh, you know it, it it counts down, and um, you you, oh, wow. you see them try and uh, you know the 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 the, the wrestler will uh, the the ring will kind of pop up so so that the wrestler is trying to get out of the pin. Uh, so he <laughs> he has a good time with that, and uh, you know I'll hey we'll have you over one day, Arush, and you can. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll definitely <laughs> stop by, and and uh, it might be hard to leave at that point. But I guess the uh, the WrestleMania it was the their most successful one ever, the the most mm. attended one, and so yeah, they're 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 on a roll. They I guess they went through some kind of uh, over the last few years. They've they kind of 
had to go uh, had to pull back a little bit because there yeah. was a lot of promises about their new newer streaming service, the WWE uh, channel or site, where they were going to have a bunch of content through there, and maybe didn't work out as well as was hoped. That, but those that's what was kind of the catalyst back in 2017, 2018. Um, and but it's slowly setting up again, and so it's it's one definitely that's worth digging into more. And hey, you know may, maybe this is able to go on another run uh, if if we get into that whenever we get into that next uh, bull market. Mm-hmm. And um, you know a lot of times it's a good thing to check out the the side area. You have the news up. Um, I believe we just had a recent um, New America on this stock uh, not not too long ago. So. Uh, look for that in the last couple of weeks. I think uh, it's the WWE stock ready to rumble while markets oh, get smacked right down. Here. So, um, yeah, not a not a bad headline for that new America. But, yeah, you just click on that. Go uh, read the new America. It'll give you some insight into what's going on, maybe uh, give you a sense of what's happening there. So um, anyway, that's going to do it for us this week. Thank you again. If you stuck around this long, uh, congratulations uh, <laughs> and well done on you. Hopefully we gave you some information that is going to be useful for you because while we are in the throes of this bear market, uh, it still is one of those things that knowing how they recover is important. You know, the sun will come out tomorrow, as Annie said, and you have to be ready for it when it does. So uh, good luck to you in terms of keeping your portfolio safe. And next week, we hope you join us because we're going to have Matt Caruso back on the show from Caruso Investments. And I've got to tell you, in terms of just being a great educator, this was a guy that was a professor of finance. And I just think he really boils things down in such a great way. So I can't wait to have him back on the show because it's always great to have Matt on. Uh, He's a frequent guest on IBD Live as well. So hope you join us for that and we will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe, rate and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you wanna watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.